I'm Dana Perino, and this is Perino on Politics. We can officially say we are one week away from the first round of voting in the 2024 presidential election cycle, and Republican candidates have been campaigning hard to try to eclipse the frontrunner who has a very commanding and seemingly enduring lead, and that is former President Trump. Joining me today is a woman who always tells it like it is, a former senior counsel to President Trump and founder of KA Consulting LLC. That's Kellyanne Conway. She's a Fox News contributor a dear friend, someone who was on the Everything Will Be Okay podcast and probably my favorite episode ever. If you want any great advice, it's all there in a 30-minute conversation. Kellyanne, welcome. Dana, thanks so much for having me today. Perino on politics, here we go. So what I try to do every week, Kellyanne, is just give people who are looking for enough to feel like they have what they need to get through the week on politics. They're not necessarily like Bill Hemmer, who today is making sure he knows all of those counties and looking at all of the fine-grained details. These are people who listen to this to say, what do I need to know? Let's start with a quick wrap-up of where we see the Republican race in Iowa a week from tonight. President Trump could make history if he breaks 50%. That would be the first time that ever happened. Yes, and Dana, this is a candidate, Donald Trump, who did not win the Iowa caucuses the first time around, Ted Cruz did, narrowly. And we have a tradition in Iowa of those who actually win the caucus, not going on to win the nomination or indeed the presidency. But it's just so different this time. Trump's dominance really is the story of 2023. Mm. And one can argue it's also been sort of the collapse or the inability to meet expectations for Governor DeSantis, who still is hanging in there, and we should mention is still around second or some in some polls third in Iowa behind Ambassador Haley. Uh, but Trump's dominance in Iowa is, is owing to a, a few things. And it's not expected to wane. His campaign team does not think that it'll wane between now and next Monday. Um, number one, they're just trying to hire a guy to do a job who's done the job before. And they, they seem to, even if they like Haley or DeSantis or they're looking at some of the other candidates, to them, it's very simple. You don't take a chance on someone who is promising. You take it, you take, you vote for somebody who's actually delivered. Um, the second thing is don't forget the absolute role of Joe Biden. And I'll say Kamala Harris is vice president in Trump's dominance. The story of Biden is he's the guy who beat Trump. He's the one who took Trump out, who saved democracy, but he's actually the one who's fueling Trump's comeback. I would say most of all. That's really the story here, that mano a mano cage match rematch, even more than the Republican primary situation. Now, Trump already made history in the most recent Iowa poll by Jay Ann Seltzer and others in that it was the largest gap between first and second place ever recorded in, at, say, in an open seat in a competitive mm-hmm. primary. Um, but, you know, I like the fact that this weekend, President Trump said publicly, hey, don't take anything for granted. We have seen that hurt really good candidates over time. I think it hurt Adam Laxalt in Nevada and Carrie Lake in Arizona, for example, in 2022. Uh, if you're, if some of the polls that were wrong have you so far ahead, that your voters stay home. For example, in northern Nevada, there was a snowstorm uh, in and around Election Day. In Arizona, people were voting early on mm-hmm. the Democratic side. So if you stay home because you're waiting to vote for Election Day because you think your candidate's so far ahead, caucuses are weird. Trump's going to win that caucus, but I think the media are lying in wait to say, oh, he only won by 30 points. It's not a real victory. Right. Dana, that would be a huge victory. Right. Like, um, some I read... No, I was listening to a a different podcast this weekend, and they said if Trump were under 40 percent, then that would be not great for him. But I'm like, but he still won if under that scenario. Yes. Yes. I mean, politics is really about math and science. You have to get more votes than the other people. And the margins don't matter. If anything, I'm looking at New Hampshire to see if those polls will hold because we've never had a 50 percent of independents vote in the New Hampshire primaries. Mm-hmm. And it could happen. I mean, the growing number of people call themselves independent in New Hampshire and elsewhere it could happen. But many of the samples in the polling have that at 50%. I think the high water mark is 40 or 41%. So we'll see if that holds. Mm-hmm. But a victory is a victory. And again, if you're going to catch Trump, since these contests are all occurring earlier than they were years ago, Dana, then you've got to stop him in New Hampshire or go down to South Carolina. And as I've said from the beginning, if you can't beat Trump in your own state, mm-hmm. then people are going to legitimately say, what are you doing there? 
the last thing I'll say is, I, I think that um, Iowa is, we should remind ourselves, Iowa is a state that President Obama and Vice President Joe Biden carried twice. And it's easy to forget that. People say, well, Iowa's red. Why is it, are we even there? Why is it? That's just not true. Biden, Obama Biden carried it twice. And then Trump turned around and carried it twice. So it really mm-hmm. has flipped. And Dana, may I just mention that I was filled with Republican women in leadership. Governor Kim Reynolds, Senator Joni Ernst, Attorney General Brenna Byrd, who I've known for years. And she took on an incumbent who had been there since the 1970s. Mm. Um, and so I really like what's been happening in Iowa. But this is also to, I guess, Bill Hemmer and Dana Perino's points about demographic changes. You have a very large Hispanic vote in Iowa now. And I think if Trump can show that strength in the caucus, then he carries that over into what I think could be a historic level of support among Hispanics for a non-incumbent Republican mm-hmm. presidential candidate. I want to talk about Biden uh, even more specifically in the second segment. Just one couple more questions on what's happening in Iowa and New Hampshire. In your opinion, does it matter whether Chris Christie stays in the race going into New Hampshire? I know he says he's in it to win it. Um, The polls don't show that. They say that maybe the polls are wrong. He's not. I haven't heard him say that specifically, but some of his people say those polls are wrong and anecdotally, they say that there is support out there. But would it matter materially to the race at all if Chris Christie is in it in New Hampshire the week of the 22nd? I believe it wouldn't matter if he dropped out because if he's part of the anti-Trump, non-Trump vote, as would be Haley or DeSantis or Ramaswamy, for that matter, anybody not named Trump, it's right now not enough. I think there's no no evidence that it would 100% go to Nikki Haley. And that somehow she can cobble and scaffold together enough to overtake Trump. Um, Also, Dana, you know this. If you are in the presidential race, you are in it to win it. And it's not as simple as this poll or that poll. It's not as simple as taking a yellow legal pad and adding up the pluses or minuses to compel you to run or to compel you to stay in a race or not to stay in a race. There's something in your gut. There's something more and bigger, usually for candidates. Mm -hmm. And they feel this is why they're running and it's most important. I think Chris Christie, he's been very public about his disappointment in Governor Chris Sununu, his friend and and a co-governor when they were serving together thinks that he should have endorsed Chris Christie and not Nikki Haley. But we'll see how much these endorsements matter. Right now, it hasn't mattered in Iowa, mm-hmm. where Governor Reynolds has done a great job. She's a very popular governor. She's done a fantastic job there, in my view. Bob Vanderplatz endorsed uh, Ron DeSantis. And Dana, the other thing I don't think we've covered enough is if Trump, if President Trump can win the Iowa caucuses with a commanding lead, including, if not especially among evangelical Christians. That's probably one of the biggest stories coming out of Iowa because people will say, oh, he's not really... Ron DeSantis is accusing Donald Trump of not truly being Mm pro-life, which is a terrible thing to say. Um, In my view, they're both pro-life and we should respect that. Uh, Bob Vanderplatz endorsed Ron DeSantis. He has a lot of weight among evangelical Christians. I think it's going to be a big story after 91 counts and four indictments and mm-hmm. indictments in four different places. So far. And all the other things so far <laughs> and all the other things surrounding my former boss and our former president. Yeah. Um, if, in fact, he can deliver the evangelical voters in Iowa. Uh, one last quick thing. Uh, last February, you said something to me in a commercial break during a segment when we were on the story with Martha McCallum. And I think that Ron DeSantis was about to have a big event. And one of the things that uh, was swirling at at that time was how many big donors were wanting to get behind Ron DeSantis and really push. And in the break, you said, you have to remember that the donors don't pick the candidate. (laughs) And boy, has that just stayed in my mind as an analytical point to just filter through all of this as we've watched the DeSantis campaign over the past year. Maybe just like a a last comment on that from you before we go to break. Sure. And in the fullness of the moment, I said, fortunately, in in a democracy, in our constitutional republic, the donors don't pick the candidates, the voters do. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the fact that under the Constitution, we are all equal. One person, one vote. That is sacrosanct. And that that is why we should accept... Uh, election results. That is why we should all participate in them if we so choose. And Dana, um, there's ne- probably never been a more true cycle than this one. I think many of those donors who were for DeSantis have abandoned him and migrated over to Nikki Haley. She had a $27 million final quarter, I read in the paper. But when you say things to New Hampshire, it's like, hey, you're here to correct 
what I was doing or make it sound like I was going to make a mistake by not voting for her, et cetera, and some other things, you know, the, the controversy about slavery and all. Um, it's, you know, that can cost you. We'll see if it, if it costs her dearly. Mm-hmm. And I mean, look, I, I think that it was always going to be difficult for anyone to run against Donald Trump and not just because right. of his base, but because of his base plus. He's going to have more people voting for him this time than before and different people. He'll do better among African Americans. He'll do better among Hispanics. He'll do even better among union households. He'll do better among independents. And again, that's got less to do with Haley and DeSantis and Christine Ramos. It has much more to do with Joe Biden, yeah. who is bleeding and hemorrhaging core components of the very delicate, very precarious and now fairly disloyal and disgruntled base of support on which he relied to win in 2020. No one can segue like you. I would add that President Trump is also in the polls winning new voters, voters who have never voted before. That's right. Which is super. And they I may be young, Dana, but they yeah. may be other voters. They may right. be new citizens. And with this outward migration we have all around the country is really fascinating to me. Years ago me it was too. You know, for example, among Hispanics, the question was, well, where did you come from? Which country? If you're Cuban, you're probably Republican. If you're Mm -hmm. Mexican, you're probably Democratic. And it was, you know, those were a bit overgeneralized, of course. (laughs) But now I'm not as interested in from where they come, but what they're doing now that they're here. Do they have school age children? Do they have grandparents living in the home? Where do they work? Did they start their own business? What kind of work? That's right. Do they own their own home, which is almost one half of Hispanics? Fascinating. Amazing. All right. We'll be right back with more Perino on Politics. And we're back with Perino on politics. Kellyanne Conway is here with us. Let's talk about President Biden. I am so baffled by so many things. <laughs> um, and when I saw a, a great tweet over the weekend from somebody who was looking at the new CBS poll. And on immigration, 7% of people polled said everything's fine. And the, the ex post said, So the Biden White House takes a look at that and says, let's go with the 7%. That seems like the winning ticket. I just interviewed on America's Newsroom three Iowa voters. They were, each one was supporting a different candidate, Trump, DeSantis, Haley. But for the first time since I've been doing these panels for the last several weeks, each one of them, their number one issue was immigration and the border. And that's a thousand miles apart, right? From Texas to Iowa. That's but right. this is affecting everyone. And the White House is so bizarrely inept or I have to start listening to some people who think they're doing it on purpose. Well, it's one or the other and neither is a good fact pattern. In fact, to the DHS secretary, Alejandro Mayorkas, who's had that job from the very beginning, still won't call it a crisis, Dana, even mm-hmm. though the vast majority of Americans do. And the politics 101, as you and I know, is we don't tell the voters what's important to them. The voters tell us what's important to them. And voters are screaming this with neon lights on their heads, that border security and immigration are top issues to them. You know, Dana, eight years after President, after Donald Trump, Mr. Trump, elevated this issue into the national consciousness, and as you know, to international ridicule, derision, and criticism, um, it's a top issue. And this is a man-made crisis at the border now. People know, they, they know what they see. Fox's Bill Malusian has done an unbelievable job, mm-hmm. as have others at the border, just by putting the cameras on and leaving the cameras on. So you can judge for yourself. If you're a voter, if you're one of the suburban moms and the Democrats are telling you it's all about abortion, it's always January 6th, it's all about climate change, and you just look up anywhere, including on CBS now and in their polling, and you just see untold numbers of people coming across the border, you don't know where they are. You don't know who they are. You know that the drugs are flooding in. Fentanyl is the number one killer of 18 to 45 year olds in our country as we speak. So you already know all this. And the Democrats want you to believe what they say, not what you see. I think voters are smart enough to go with what they see. The CBS poll was fascinating, Dana. A, that they're asking the questions in a granular fashion that they are. They literally asked the question, if someone is coming here and seeking asylum and saying they came here for religious um, or uh, violence reasons, persecution that way. What do you think we should do with them? 44% said, uh, let them stay here until they have a hearing. I don't think they know some of these hearing dates are in 2028 and 2029. But 43% mm-hmm. said, let them wait somewhere else until that hearing, which essentially is the remain in Mexico, the Trump-Pence administration had. But a 13%, Dana, said, 
don't do anything. Don't give them a hearing. Don't let them in. So you have a majority of Americans now saying, don't, don't give them a hearing. Don't let them in. Mm-hmm. The other question CBS asked in that poll is, um, whether you support or oppose in your own town or city, providing basic services and needs, taking care of the needs of migrants temporarily. They asked that question. 55% of the one CB- CBS survey nationwide, Dana, said, no, I oppose providing basic needs and services on a temporary basis to migrants in my town or city. Wow, what a change that is. Mm-hmm. And it's just because people see, and they look at this as national security. They look at it as sovereignty. They look at it as fairness. It's all wrapped up in one. Mm-hmm. And, you know, look what's happening even in, um, in, in Gaza. The Palestinians were told by neighboring Jordan and Egypt, don't come here. Don't come right. here. And in this country, we're just telling everybody, come here, come, come here. It's shocking. Yes. It really is. Let me ask you something that I'll, I'll tell you what I think first, but then you can say uh, what you think. With a lot of people asking this question, do you believe Joe Biden will stick it out to be his party's nominee to run for re-election. I say yes. What do you think? Yes, I say yes. I say yes. The clock is ticking. I think the clock is ticking even on some of these groups like No Labels, for example. Oh, yeah, I agree. Very well funded, but hasn't been able to field a ticket. It's going to surprise us all. And they're talking to congressmen and senators and and governors, which by their very definition, Dana, already have labels. Yeah, (laughs) I know. I've always, I've never understood, like, if you want to have a real third party, why not call it something like, uh, you know, truth and justice or something? There you go, something. <laughs> like no labels doesn't really uh, get you enthusiastic about things. That's right. And so I think the <laughs> clock is ticking on everyone. Uh, the time is tolling. And so, th- so yes, I do believe it'll be Joe Biden. Um, if I were a Democrat, I would have gotten rid of Biden and Harris in yeah. a more elegant way. And I would just roll the dice, Dana Perino, and I'd say, look, we may lose in 2024, but we'll save the party. And we may even be able to hang on to the Senate, get back the House, but the entire party is so demoralized and constantly defending things they know they don't believe right. in just because of Trump, 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 that they're hurting the party. This party that always represented youth and energy and outsiders, obviously Barack Obama and JFK and Bill Clinton, even Jimmy Carter was in his early 50s, Dana, when he came to the White House as president in January 1977. Mm-hmm. And now that they had back to back insiders um, and not exactly spring chickens, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden as their nominees, they've gone the other way. Mm -hmm. And if anything, the younger people who are best known in the Democratic Party right now are sort of anti-Israel. They won't even condemn Hamas. The squad, Mm -hmm. uh, Jamal Bowman, Mm -hmm. uh, these other folks who are like the young, they're supposed to be the young and up and coming members. They're so out of sync and out of touch with mainstream America on any number of issues that I just don't know what becomes of the Democratic Party. But they're going to hang on to Biden. They're convinced that he beat Trump once. He can beat him again. Probably won't debate. We have no evidence that Joe Biden can stand somewhere for 90 minutes and uh, that he'll want to debate Donald Trump in 2024 or whoever the, you know, whoever the nominees are. But yes, I believe it will be them. Me too. Um, As we go to break, I'll just tell you something that you, something you've already known because of your profession and your expertise, but something that President Bush told me in 2008 as John McCain became the nominee and he was talking about, you know, it'll be, it'll be tough one because of. Bush's popularity at the time and Republican Party politics at the time. But he said, Americans like to go forward generationally. They don't like to necessarily look backwards. And so Biden said he would be transitional. He is not. And so we we are where we are. We will be right back with more Perino on politics next. And we're back with Perino on politics and with Kellyanne Conway. Just a short segment here, Kellyanne. I always like to ask this question of the smart friends that I have. What do you think I might be missing in this election coverage? What are you paying attention to or looking at that you see as something that, aha, that is a little bit of a tell that other people might not see? We all cover Hispanics as a very large and increasingly consequential group of Americans and then voters. But what I'm really struck by is that the average age for Latinos right now in this country, Dana, is 30. White's average age is 44. Um, Asians, 35, just by way of example, African-Americans, 37. Why do I say this? Because they tend to have school-aged children. One of every four school-aged children in this country is Hispanic. And they're not just in California, Florida, Texas, New York anymore. They're a very large percentage of the population, say, in North Carolina, in Georgia, in places where 
you know, the work is there. And they outperform their numbers population-wise as part of the labor participation workforce. They, of course, they elevate home ownership and small business ownership, economic upward mobility. Education is really important to them. And I believe that the Democrats are bleeding and losing Hispanic voters because of their outright hostility to religion. They're off, they're often offering their thoughts and no prayers when there's a tragedy. Oddly enough, they, um, they, they also miscued, misread the mainstream Hispanic appetite of Hispanic Americans in this country. When it came to border security and immigration, they totally misread them. If anything, they stereotyped them. But I'm watching them because I think they're just going to increase in, in their prominence as a voting bloc. And uh, I would actually, I would say that President Trump as the nominee should give real thought to a person of color to be on the ticket with him. I think he should give another look to Marco Rubio. Obviously, there are others who fit that bill. Um, mm-hmm. But that's something, we're not missing it so much. We're missing why it's so consequential for such a long time now. And it's going to continue to be a very long time into the future. The other thing I would just say is I believe, Dana, what's happening in our cities is going to have a major impact on votes outside of the cities. So the cities will still vote Democratic and they'll still vote for Democrats. But the people watching what's happening in our cities and not wanting their kids to apply to college there or move there for work, who no longer want to go to dinner or see a show there, who just say, you know what? I I think that's just going to reverberate outward into the suburbs and the rural communities in a way that we haven't seriously appreciated yet. So usually you're the direct stakeholder, right? You live in the cities, you're going to vote according to the cities. I think it's people watching what's happening there who don't live anywhere near there who are going to have that very prominently in their voter quiver. It's really true about not wanting to you know, risk your safety, pay the money, go in for parking. And so, you know, I hear it even from like my mom in Denver. Uh, You know, it's not just New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. It is all the cities, St. Louis, some of the mid-sized cities as well having that problem. Kellyanne, before I let you go, we have a little quiz. It's very easy though. There's three possible topics. You get to choose which one and then it's multiple choice. Uh, We have Dana's Book Club, Candidate LinkedIn or Dana Reads Sports? Oh, Dana Reads Sports, for Okay, sure. we'll see. So this sportscaster, known for calling the World Series from 1996 to 2021, guest hosted Jeopardy in August of 2021. The choices are A, Joe Buck, B, Joe Girardi, or C, Paul O'Neill. Joe Buck. You know everything. And well, that's I'm why we love fan, you. And I'm a big sports fan. I know and you Paul, are. Paul hey. O'Neill was on the Yankees and Joe Girardi was their, was their manager and then went over to the Philadelphia Phillies. So it had to be Joe Buck. I did feel for you, <laughs> frankly, when I was watching the New York Giants-Eagles oh, yes. game. Eagles but you wore your apart. green anyway. And I, I got, got it anyway. That. You got to be loyal. They'll break your heart every time. <laughs> I, I tell my kids, that. Dana, I tell my ki- my four teenagers what everyone tells their kids and kids who are important to them, who are they're helping to raise. I say, you can be who you want, love who you want, go do what you want, make your own mistakes, make your own successes. But to remain in this family, you must be a Philadelphia Eagles fan. <laughs> and they see what heartbreak really means. I am going to keep that in mind. And I'm going to come to dinner one of these days. And I would love, Can't to, wait. love to do that. I want to get to know you. you um, even more because you're a fabulous person. Thank you for being on Perino on Politics. Perino on Politics, Dana for dinner. We love it all. <laughs> all right. Everything's going to be all right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app. <laughs> 